Greetings everyone, this is Pastor Alan Baggett and this is today's Victory Church Online Sunday Morning Message. So glad to have you guys here today. It's been an eventful day for us already and, uh, and we're going to have an eventful next few weeks. Two weeks, two weeks we're going to be in our brand new building. I'm in that foyer right now, still, it's still a li little empty because we just got a few things here. But in the next two weeks, things are going to start getting bustling and start going pretty quickly. So we got all the ground work done and a lot of the big things that go up quickly uh, are fits to go up and it's going to start looking, taking shape very quickly. So we're very excited about it and uh, just excited about your participation in this with us. Now, having said that, just going to let you know, March 7th is our first service in the building. We'd love to have you in, in person with us, if you possibly can, to celebrate that, that great day. And uh, also, if you'd like to help us financially, we got two weeks. We're still $8,500 down in the budget uh, to complete everything that needs to be done. So uh, if you can help us and participate in that, in that we are down to the wire. And uh, I know there's some people out there that have been kind of holding out to the end to see what we needed. Well, we're there. We are there, and we need you to reach out and go ahead and, and do whatever you were planning on doing, what God has spoken into your heart. And you can do that simply by going to todaysvictory.com, going to the giving button, going to the giving module, which will take you to the giving module, and you can give right there. You can give by text. It's, it's available right there. You see it on the screen. Or you can mail it to us at 300 Spring Hollow Road, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, 37072. So just uh, if you can, be a part of that. But two weeks is going to be Victory Sunday. Cannot wait. It's going to be great. And so thankful that you're all here. I have a message preparing as we get up into this, uh, where we're going. I'm talking about uh, the journey. The journey. And and uh, that we're taking right now and the journey that we're taking as children of God during these unprecedented times that we live in right now. And so I've chosen for the last few weeks and, and this week and, and next week to talk about the journey that we're all on. And this morning I want to go ahead and proceed with that also. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. This is what I'm going to deal with. I'm not sure how far I'm going to get into this today. I maybe get through the whole thing. But I definitely want to read these passages because this is where I'm coming out of. Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And this is uh, uh, Paul writing right here. And he says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come, see you, uh, come to you, but was hindered until now that I may have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, much, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. As I begin to read this passage, there's several, there's two or three points I really want to, to, to get into your spirit this morning about the journey, about the intensity of the journey, about the willingness of the journey that we're on. And as we open up right here into this passage, this whole statement is about Paul's desire and Paul's willingness. His desire and willingness to go to Rome and share the gospel. He wanted to go. It was his greatest desire to go. And to understand uh, Paul's declaration of his wanting to go and his willingness to go, we have to come to an understanding that that uh, the purposes that God has for our life always don't match up with our, with, uh, with our desires. So to understand Paul's declaration, we must come to know that we are all created. Every one of us are created with purpose. Every one of us created with purpose. You were created 
for a reason and a purpose. You may not understand it right now. You may not understand your journey. Uh, your, your purpose may not even be matching up with your desires right now. But I'm just telling you right now, you are made for a purpose and a specific destiny that God pour, uh, preordained, sit there and made you and created you, thought about you. And, uh, and laid it all out. The road may not seem so easy right now, but I'm telling you, God has a purpose and God has a plan. In fact, we read in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, not only that, He's saying, listen, I preordained you. Before you were ever born, I knew who you were. We sat down and we figured this whole thing out, what we wanted to have in your life. You have a purpose. It may not always match up with everything going around you, but I promise you, you have a purpose and you need to hang on and you need to keep following along on this journey so that God can fulfill that purpose in your life. And to back that up, let's look into Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, the word says... For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What's this saying? We are His workmanship. We, is, or we are His workmanship. He prepared us beforehand. So you, you may not understand all your purpose right now or, 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 God's, or even God's plan for your life. But we must do exactly as Paul did as we begin to read in these few verses in Romans right here and begin to prepare ourselves and to begin to prepare ourselves for God's purpose and prepare ourselves for God's plan. You see, when, when God begins to move and His plan begins to open up, that's not the time for preparation. That's the time for action. That's the time for going forward. That's the time for moving forward. That's not the time to go into fasting and prayer. That's not the time to uh, get yourself and your body and your mind and your spirit prepared. That's the time to move. Preparation becomes before purpose takes place. So we have to understand and do what he did. We get, begin to prepare ourselves. Begin to prepare ourselves. In fact, in verse 13, Paul says, I often plan to come to you. So he is planning. I often planned to come to you, but it says, I was hindered until now. I was hindered. Something hindered him. Something hindered him from, going, from doing what was the desire of his heart. Something was hindering him. Something was causing him. Uh, this word hindered right here, if you'll allow me, uh, gives the idea of prevention. It means to prevent something to withhold something, to deny something, to refuse something. So he's saying right here, I was hindered. I was hindered until now. I was refused to be able to go until now. I was denied the ability to be able to go until now. I was prevented by obstacles and prevented by things to be able to come to you uh, as of yet. But I was, I was hindered. And he's beginning to pour out his case and tell them his desire to be with them and and everything, but that there's something hindering him to be there. And as we look at that word, say, and Paul is saying that he was prevented, that something was holding him back, and something was denying him, and something was refusing him. <clears throat> I can't go any further without bringing this up, is if you go into the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus is speaking about the children coming to Jesus. But children are just coming and sitting at his feet. And he uses the word, do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. Where the word forbid right there is the exact same word that Paul is using when he says, I was hindered. I was hindered until now. And before I can go any further, I just got to bring this up. Let me read this. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 14. The Bible says, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to this. He's saying to the, about the children, don't prevent them from coming to me. Don't prevent them from coming to me. Don't, with, don't withhold them from me. Don't deny 
Don't deny them my presence. Don't refuse them to come to my feet. Don't deny them the ability to be in my presence and to sit at my feet. He says, don't hinder them. Don't prevent them. Don't forbid them. This is the same language. This is the same language that Paul is using when he says, until this time I've been hindered. Until this time I've been hindered, I've been prevented. And God comes and tells us, don't, for those who are around you and those that are around you, don't hinder them. Sometimes we're hindered in our purpose. Sometimes we're prevented in our purpose. Sometimes there's obstacles in our way and things take place that we can't uh, fulfill our complete purpose at this present moment or this present time. But God is working on it. And He's telling us that we need to prepare ourselves. To prepare ourselves for that time that when that hindrance is removed. Sometimes that hindrance is from the enemy. Sometimes that hindrance comes from God because it's not our moment or our time. We want to kind of jump the gun. We want to get right on it to what God wants us to do and the, and the desires and the purposes that He has in our spirit and our life. And He said, it's not time yet. And there's sometimes hindrances come up into our life simply because of that. That's where we had to bring on our spiritual, our spirituality and our spirit of discernment and begin to discern what is from the enemy and, and what is from the Lord. And sometimes that's quite a difficult task. But he comes out and that's where that comes from. Now the next verse is very interesting. It says in verse 14, Romans 1, 14, then he says, after he says all this, he says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Now, what in the world does he mean, I'm a debtor? What's he mean that I'm a debtor? You see, when, when you are a debtor or you're in debt, it signifies an obligation. It signifies an, under, uh, an obligation. In other words, when you're in debt, when you're in debt, uh, you're under obligation to what you are in debt to. But as we're talking right here, and he says, I am a debtor to both Greeks and barbarians. What is he talking about? What kind of debt, what kind of obligation does Paul have to these guys, to the Greeks? What, what, what debt does he have to the barbarians? These guys aren't even Jews. What does he have to the Greek and to the barbarians? What kind of obligation could he possibly have? What is that debt? I know, I know that I have a debt. And I'm not talking about a credit card or a car payment or a, or a mortgage payment, but I have a debt. I have a sin debt. I have a sin debt. Every one of us do. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We were all born into this world with a, with a, a sinful body, with a seed of sin. Adam, Adam secured that for us. We have that seed of sin inside of us and we deal with that in our body and, and we deal with our body and our body and our spirit, they clash and they clash against each other so often. I have a sin debt. And the truth is, without the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of that sin and because of my failings and because of all the mess that's been in my life and the things that I've done, I, I deserve hell. I, de I deserve hell. But it's because, but because that is the debt. That is the payment of the debt. But Christ, as you already know, but Christ on the cross took that debt on for me. He became my burden bearer. He took, a, he took that debt upon himself. He took responsibility for that debt. And, and now he has taken the debt of my sin upon him and now I am free and now I can be covered by the blood of the cross and our Lord Jesus Christ and, and even though I am not perfect in every area of my life I can ask for God, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to cover my life and it washes all the black stains and all the black sin and all the and, and discouragements and all the things that I allowed to get into my spirit in my life it washes it away and what once was black and gray and gloomy and, and filled with muck and mire is now washed clean, pure and white and, and is a beautiful fountain of life flowing out of my life because of that cross. And because he took that debt, I still have a debt. I have a life debt. 
I have a life debt to Christ. So I willingly place myself under obligation for the debt that I owe. I willingly lay myself under obligation for the debt that I owe, for the debt that He took from me. Because I deserved hell. But He gave me life. And He went to the cross and He suffered so that I wouldn't have to suffer the pains of hell and the pains of the weaknesses and the sin in my body. Jesus loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. God loves you. So I willingly place myself under the obligation of the debt I owe. Are we not under obligation? Are we not actually debtors to God? Are we not the workmanship of His hand? Are we not, the de are we not debtors to the, to, 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 as the creation, to the Creator that created us? Are we not in debt to that? Are we not debtors to the redemption that it, the cross has given us through the cross that when Christ took His sin upon Him and took it away and the penalty of sin has been lifted from us? Are we not in debt to that? Are we not in debt because... The debt of the sin of our life has been canceled. Are we not in debt to the one who took our place? You see, Paul's looking at these people and he's saying, I'm in, under obligation because of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ to both the Greeks and to the barbarians to give them the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To show them a way. To show them that there's a better way. He says, I am under obligation to share the good news of Jesus. The good news of the Gospel. Having said that, I can say this with quite a surety in my heart that we are bound by a divine mission to preach the Gospel. Not just me sitting here preaching the Gospel, but every one of you guys. Everyone who's listening, everyone's in my congregation, everyone that sits in the pew, everyone who's listening right now, we are under an obligation. We are under, under debt. We are bound by divine purpose and by divine mi mission to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I preach it this way and I do it different other ways, but God has given you purpose and He's given you talents and He's given you things that you need to be using to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ saves and there is hope. That's exactly Exactly what the world needs right now. We don't need, we don't need more of this junk that's going on around us. People need hope. They need to know that there's something they can look forward to tomorrow, that there's something beyond just this flesh and this life that we live in right now. There's something greater that's beyond every one of us. There is a victory that we can have today, and there is a hope that we can have for tomorrow. The world needs hope. That's why we can speak these words. This is, why, this is why Paul can speak these words in verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, I am not. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. How can you live under such great conviction? How can someone live under that great of a conviction? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's only one way that can take place. And we must have a change of nature. We must have a change in our mind. We must have a change of our perspective. We have to have a change. You see, when our nature completely changes, when our thought process completely changes, when we're washed by His presence and we're washed by His Word and we completely begin to change. How many times have I missed God and His plan? How many times have you missed God and His plans for you? Because you're just too stubborn 
to listen to what God had to say. You were just too stubborn. You didn't want to hear it. It didn't match up with what you wanted to do. It didn't match up with your desires. It didn't match up with what you thought you, you had to do. And you just went ahead and did your own thing anyway, hoping that God would just sign on to it. And hopefully something would come good out of it. How many times have we missed God's best? How many times have we missed God's best? Because we were just too stubborn to listen to God. You see in 2 Kings chapter 5, we, find, we see Naaman. He's a great man of valor, but he has leprosy. And he goes to Elisha to hear from God. And Elisha tells him to go to the Jordan and dip seven times and he'll be healed. Well, Naaman immediately says, why should I go to Jordan and dip seven times and be healed? There's plenty of other wonderful rivers that are clean and pure and not muddy and nasty. And uh, I, I can go and I can dip in those. And, and, and Elisha says, no, you go to the Jordan and dip seven times. So Naaman goes to the Jordan. He listens and he goes to the Jordan and he, and, and he yields to what is being told to him to do. And as he goes in there and he dips one, two, three, four, five, six times. And he comes up the sixth time and he still has leprosy and he still has the sores and he, he still has everything. What would have happened if he had only dunked six times? What would have happened if he only went under six, six times and never went under the seventh time? You see, when he went under the seventh time and he began to walk in complete obedience to, the, to what God had told him to do through Elisha, when he came up the seventh time, he came up a new man. He came up a new man. He came up a different man. You say, what are you saying, Pastor? I want you to listen to me. You see, God is speaking to you and He's telling you things in your spirit and your heart. And, and you're going for it and you, you go out and you begin to try to do it and complete it and it's just not working out the way you think it should work out. Sometimes when things aren't working the way we think they should work and we need to keep on working. Sometimes we're like Naaman. We're, we've dipped one time, two times, three times, four times, five. And God's been telling you, I want you to keep on going because I've got something for you. And there's a change of nature and there's a change of you and there's a change of your ministry, the change of your life and your family that's just on the precipice about to happen. And we quit. And we give up because it's just, just too hard and we could have just dipped one more time. Just one more time. But Naaman comes in and he dips the seventh time and he comes up completely healed. His nature's changed. His body's changed. He receives exactly what, exactly what Elisha said that he was going to receive because he was obedient. But there was somebody there with him. His servant was there with him. And his servant witnessed the miracle. He witnessed the change. And he saw the change in his nature. So Naaman wants to send a gift back to Elijah to give him his appreciation and his thanks. And the servant took the gift to Elisha. And when he went to Elisha to tell him what happened in the events, he left out the part about the gift. And he lied to Elisha so that he could keep the extravagant gift for himself. And the Bible tells us that then the leprosy that had plagued Naaman was laid upon his servant because he lied and he stole the offering. And not only did the leprosy lay upon him, but the leprosy laid upon him and all of his generations. It didn't just affect him, it affected his children and it affected his grandchildren. And it affected his children's children's children. You say, Pastor, I don't understand. What's, what, what are you saying? I'm saying there's a difference between being a witness and being the one who changed. There's a difference between being the witness and the one who has been changed. You see, we come to the church, we watch people go to the altar, and we watch them change, and we watch God touch them and we sit back and wish that would happen for us and all we are is witnesses all we are is witnesses we're, we're witnessing the change that was taking place but we're not being the one that's being changed 
You see, you'll never understand the obligation. You'll never understand the debt, the debt until you have a change of nature. You will never know peace. You'll never know joy. You'll never know blessing until you have a change of nature and you step out of becoming a witness to the power of God and the move of God and the promise of God and you become the one who's being blessed. You have to step out. Sometimes you have to dip seven times. Sometimes you have to push when you feel like you can't push any longer. Sometimes you got to go when you don't feel like you can go any longer. When everything's looking against you and everything looks like it's going under, you got to keep pushing. You got to keep. You got to keep going. You must keep coming to God and keep coming to God and keep coming into God until your nature changes. I don't care if you got to come down a thousand times. I want you to come down until your nature, until your nature changes and your mind changes and everything about you changes and you become and you begin to walk in the blessing and the promise of God. If you have to come down every Sunday, come down every Sunday. I want you to come down until your nature is changed. Don't be Naaman's servant. Don't just be a witness. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. Don't be the one that just sits back and watches. Be the one that jumps in and dives in to whatever's going on. You say, Pastor Ryan, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for my nature to change? Verse 15 begins to open that up for us. And it says, I am ready to preach the gospel. I am ready to preach the gospel. That Greek word right, right here is Prometheus. And it means pre prepared and willing. And I'm going to talk about that next week. I'm going to stop right there because I, I, need, I need to stop right here. Because I just felt a, a, a move in my heart. I'm going to pick up right there on, on being ready. Verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel. Because I just felt, I just felt a twinge in my spirit right now. There's people out here who have lost your purpose. You're losing your hope. You're losing your way. And as a result, you've become one of those who just step to the side and you're you're just a witness. You're just a participant. You're just a. You're, you're not. Uh, you're not. You're. You're a spectator. You're just a witness. You're a spectator. You're not participating. You're just on the sidelines. And you're on the sidelines because you've chosen to be on the sidelines. And God is speaking to you right now. That He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And even though it's not being completely fully manifested right now, and it seems like everything's going the opposite direction instead of the right direction, that he said, you just keep on going. Just keep on going. Because I am not finished yet. And when I am finished, everyone's going to stand in awe. They're going to look around and say, look what God has done in her. Look what God has done in him. I thought it was all over. I thought it was, they were all washed up. But look what God has done. Don't be the servant. Don't be the servant. Be the one that goes in the river and dips. Don't be the witness. Be the participator. Don't be the witness. Be the participator. Walk in, walk in what God has you to walk in and watch what happens. God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for your life. And things go upside down. Things turn around. Things go the wrong way sometimes. But God has a reason and God has a purpose. And if you will prepare yourself, not prepare yourself to protect yourself from being hurt, but prepare your spirit and prepare your mind. Begin to allow God to change your nature, to change your mindset, to change everything around you, to change all the things that are inside of you so that when it comes time to verse 15 that we're going to read uh, in our next message when it comes to that time that you are ready 
Because when you get to verse 15 and you're ready to preach the gospel, when it comes to verse 15 and you're ready to go and step out, it's not the time to get ready. You are ready. You are pre-prepared. It's the times in the beginning where you're a bond servant. It's the time in the beginning when you're weeping in the altars. It's the time in the beginning where you're sitting back and you're saying, God, I want you to use me. And when you're not being used the way you want to be used, you find ways to be used. You're preparing yourself. You're preparing yourself. Because when God opens that door, no man's going to shut it. And God's speaking to you right now. Right now. You sit back and say, I'm just not going to do anything else because it just ain't working for me. You're quitting before your purpose has been found. You're like Naaman. What if he had only stopped it six times? He would still have leprosy. He would have died a leper. But he lived out the rest of his days in health because he listened. And he kept going under until his nature was changed. I don't know what it's going to take for you. I don't know how long. I, don't, I can't tell you all that stuff. But I can tell you this, that God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. You just got to get up every day and keep going. You got to get up every day and wash yourself. You got to get up every day and cleanse yourself. You got to get up every day and cleanse yourself in your body and your mind and your spirit until your nature changes. And watch what God does in your life. I'm telling you, purpose will explode. Purpose will explode. Hope will begin to just gush. Hallelujah. How many times are you willing to go under? I think we need to go under and push forward until our nature changes. So every promise in our life can be fulfilled. So our purpose can be fulfilled. Amen. Let me pray with you right now. God, I just thank you for your goodness and your grace, Father, your mercy. I thank you for those who are with us this morning, Father, and I just ask that you just deal with their hearts, Father, and deal with their spirits. Those who feel like giving up, Father, those that feel like they've just gone over and over and over the same thing over and over and over again. Father, let hope begin to spring up and rise up in them, Father, right now. Because there's those who are sitting and watching and listening right now that they just need to cleanse one more time. They just need to dip into the water one more time. And they're going to come up with a changed nature. You have a miracle waiting for them. You have something so great for them that they can't even comprehend. And, and the devil's fighting hard, tooth and toenail, to, to, to convince them just to quit and give up and, and move on, Father. But right now, I speak to each and every one of those right now that they'll not quit, they'll not give up. I rebuke the enemy of their soul right now that is whispering those lies of defeat into their ears and speak life and health, Father. And not only life and health, Father, but discernment and joy and peace, Father, that, that as, they, as they push forward, that they'll come up with a changed nature, Father, and that, and that they'll be fulfilled with all blessing, all peace, and all joy. And we just speak that forth, Father, now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ over everyone that's listening right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Listen, don't forget, if you're not on Facebook, uh, point your friends over to uh, todaysvictory.com. This lesson is on there. This message is on there right now. And they can view it that way if they don't have it through Facebook. But the best thing is to share this message with people, especially get ready for next week because this next week when I wind it up and I, I, I wind all these scriptures together, it's going to be, it's going to be powerful. It's going to be good. And it's going to bless your life. And you're going to see beyond what I just talked about right here even. So I just hope you hold on for that and uh, check us out on that. Amen. And listen, if you want to give, you know, go to todaysvictory.com, hit the giving button. We've got two weeks left and a lot of work to do. And we need your help. And some of you have been waiting to see where we get to this point. Right now is the moment of decision. Uh, do what God has spoken to your heart so that we can go ahead and get this finished up. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.